Hello everybody, welcome to Leet Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Leet Wine TV. Everybody, welcome to Leet Wine TV. I'm your host, Mark Fusco, here for another edition of the show. So uh, this is a special edition. I'm here at the Texas Hill Country Winery Symposium at the Horseshoe Bay Resort. Um, I'm in the room. I just checked in a little while ago. Um, we got we got things going on here. Up, 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 up. I'm playing with my new gimbal. I got the DGI Osmo. We got the football game going on over here. Um, room's pretty nice. You can kind of. Whoop. I'm still learning how to use the gimbal here. You know, it's all good. Exposure might be a little bit off here because uh, I've, I've got the natural sunlight going through. We're going to uh, gonna switch it off real quick to uh, to see what's outside as my, uh, here we go. We gotta get the, uh, oh, I guess I can't do that uh, on the fly. So um, I'm gonna kind of bring this around here to my to my back. And we're going to let the auto, it's a little bit washed out there. So there we go. So uh, let me step out of the way here. So uh, that's the that's the view right there. I'm only on the third floor, but it's all good. And uh, this should be a pretty smooth video of me walking around. But yeah, I'm pretty excited about doing this. Um, it's the first time I've come here for the symposium. Let's uh, Let's get myself back up here. Ooh, it's a little bit. Yeah, there we go. All right, sorry. Um, so this is my first year out over at the symposium. Uh, I've been really kind of wanting to do this for a while. Um, man, I'm really washed out. Sorry, we're just trying to. There we go. So uh, anyway, as I said, I've been, <laughs> been wanting to do this uh, symposium for quite a while. Um it's just that usually January is a very really bad month for me to try to take time off. Um, and the reason I can take time off now is, well, I'm looking for a job. So um, uh, back in December, uh, I uh, unfortunately, uh, where I was working uh, for three months, just was not the right fit. Um, I was working at a private club and um, just didn't, you know, my, my goals and my skill set um, just weren't maybe the best fit. Uh, to work at the club. The club was a great club. Uh, I loved working there. The hours were awesome. The schedule was great. Um, but uh, for, for the type of work I, I want in restaurants, it just wasn't quite, quite what I was looking for. So I'm taking kind of a break. Um, one of the reasons I'm here at the symposium is, besides to learn, is to connect with some Texas wineries. Um, I'm looking to get into uh, either working for a winery directly or in distribution. So basically the distribution side of things. Um, I've got some applications out there for a couple places, a couple more uh, jobs I've seen posted that I'm going to apply for. Um, so I'm here for the uh, for the symposium um, as media, um, but I'm also going to network with some of the wineries. And then uh, then coming up this month is the San Antonio, San Antonio Cocktail Conference. Um, that's going to be more of just like me being there and, and doing stuff and learning. Probably not as much networking on that, but you never know. I might go into liquor distribution. Um, and then after that, I'm going to the Psalms Under Fire a competition in Austin. And uh, I'm just going there just to go. Um, again, maybe some networking opportunities, but between now and then, um, you know, we got a lot of stuff going on. Normally, I just do the San Antonio Cocktail Conference. Psalms Under Fire is on a Sunday, so a lot of times I don't take that uh, because of my previous schedule I've always had. Taking a Sunday off isn't always the easiest thing to do, um, especially, you know, if I, if I take the Sunday off for cocktail conference, taking two Sundays off in a row is kind of difficult. And sometimes Psalms Under Fire is also on the same – also the same weekend as cocktail conference. So I've had to like make a decision which one I want to go to. So um, I'm excited to go to the, to the, uh, I'm excited to go to the Psalms under fire uh, thing too. But anyway, for today, uh, so I'm, I'm here actually a full day early, actually almost two days early. The official symposium doesn't start until Tuesday. Um, there is a Monday night 
um, uh, pre, pre-symposium seminar about, uh, there's two of them. I'm going to one about music and wine. Go figure, right? Um, so I've got all the rest of the day today, Sunday. And uh, I mean, I got here early, but the room was ready. Uh, I was backwards. I'm like, why is it not going the way it should? Um, so I've got the Sunday, rest of the day, Sunday, I'm going to watch more football. And then uh, I've got um, the uh, all day tomorrow. And I might be doing some uh, networking tomorrow if possible. Anyway, uh, stay tuned for the rest of the week. I'm going to have a little n- n- tidbits. I'm also uh, hoping to have two regular interviews. So we'll make it two actual shows out of this. Um, that will be in February. And uh, besides just a recap video of my time here. All right. All right, everybody. So I'm out here hanging out on the, uh, the grounds of the, um, <laughs> the grounds of the, uh, I got bees and stuff out here. That's awesome. No, track me, track me this way. There we go, Osmo. Anyway, so I'm out here on the grounds of the uh, Horseshoe Bay Resort. Beautiful place. I took a ton of pictures. Um, I'll probably put those in here somewhere. Um, they got a putt putt, that 18 hole putt putt thing here. They said it's based upon the um, their actual putting greens of the actual golf course. Um, so that's pretty cool. And I mean, if you can see, we got all kinds of got fountains all over the place we got places for people to hang out we got a little sports bar that's kind of near the all the putting greens or the uh the um whatchamacallit the putt putt um a couple of restaurants so they got a cool spot here um and there's definitely residents in the area there's apartments that are i can see from my um whatchamacallit my room and uh it's pretty cool. Also, I think it was a shout out to, I don't remember, I don't know her name, but the, the lady at the CVS who uh, directed me to Walmart because I'm using this. I didn't have my uh, micro SD card and I went to the CVS and I'm like, hey, um, I don't really need something with 32 gigs on a micro SD. She goes, well, Walmart's got like eight gigs and 16 and six, or whatever. I'm like, all right. Well, I got a, I still ended up with like a, I think it's 32 gig anyway, but it was like half the price than the uh, CVS one. So kudos to her for, for doing that. Um, yeah, so follow me the other way. There we go. Follow me. So yeah, we got cool grounds here. Um, and I'm just, I'm just digging the fact that I get to use my Osmo here. I mean, I'm going to walk around. Um, I'm going to head back to, it's not really following me, is it? Um, anyway. So yeah, I'm just gonna, today is a day of just kind of doing nothing. I might do some putt-putt because there's really nothing going on today until like, I think it's five o'clock today. There's a seminar or somewhere around five o'clock. Hello, follow me, there we go. And uh, I did find a cool spot for, to do my interviews. Um, Lighting should be good, it's outside. So it should be all good. Oh yeah, check this out. Here, boom. We got checkers, oops, here we go. Got checkers here. How cool is that? All right. So anyway, um, before everybody thinks I'm crazy walking around talking to myself. <laughs> Here, let's uh, follow me. There we go. You got a whole area here. Uh, there's like a children's. can't see it. Man, I got I to gotta get used to this thing. So over there behind me, there's some guys working over there. I'm trying not to get them. That's like a children's like jungle gym or something. I don't know. Uh, we got stuff for kids. There's a pavilion over here. Um, more fountains. I took a bunch of pictures of turtles, by the way, because they got a ton of turtles here and all the and all the thing. Um, I'm still kind of distracted with the. It's trying to track all kinds of stuff here, and I'm just trying to walk around where no one's at, so that I don't get anybody in the shop behind me. Technically. There's no ex- expectation of privacy here because it is, you know, it's private property, it's public areas, but I'm trying not to get anybody in the background. And actually, where I'm going to do my interviews, there's someone working there, so I'd show it to you, but then I'd have to get an NDA or not an NDA, some type of, no, I wouldn't. But anyway, this is kind of cool right here. Whoop, let's go down here. We got that. You can eat outside if the weather's nice. Weather's not too bad. It's like, it's kind of humid out. It's kind of cloudy, but 
it's kind of nice. We'll show, we'll show you the... Anyway, that's it for this little update. All right, so uh, day one, <clears throat> a recap of day one. So day one is really just kind of like a half day, not even a half day. It's really just like a night session. Um, so uh, as you saw in, in the previous clip, I just kind of hung out on uh, Monday and uh, walked around the grounds. I took a lot of pictures. Um, I don't know if I've put them where I've put them, but I've taken a lot, took a lot of pictures of the grounds. A uh, really nice place. Um, started, got, started meeting some people. Of course, there's some people I do know in the industry because, I mean, I do visit Texas wineries and, you know, and, uh, and all that. But I got to meet some people and uh, really went to a really, really cool um, a seminar last night uh, about how music changes your perception of wine and the quality of the wine. Uh, it, it's not necessarily... So in, in, one, in one example, the gentleman was gave us a white Zinfandel and said, if we listen to this piece of music, it was going to be the best wine of the four wines because we had a white Zin and we had like a, uh, a Texas Pinot, a Texas um, Moved, and a Texas Tanat. So we had three Texas wines and then we had a California white Zin. That particular piece, which was one of the last pieces we listened to, yes, the white Zin tasted better, but I still wouldn't have picked it over the other three reds, but the reds did diminish in perception. So um, I'd have to say overall that um, that seminar really drives home or w w made, made the point. It, 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 it proved that forces can or, or external things can uh, change your perception of wine. Um, I've definitely been uh, a, a, um, a believer in that your environment in general will change your perception about a wine. Now, the, the example I use a lot is when you go to a wedding and you have wine at a wedding and <clears throat> the wine's not the focus. The wine's just a beverage. It's just something there to help facilitate the good time. Or it's the beer, or it's the liquor, but wine in general, because wine, wine's a, a kind of a different animal when it comes to beverages. And <clears throat> you go to the bride and groom, you go, man, this wine's awesome, what's the name of the wine? I wanna get it when I go home. And then you go home, you find the wine, you know, on your, at your wine shop or your grocery store shelf or online, you order it, you buy it, whatever, you get it home. And then you crack it open and you're in the quiet of your own home. You're not in the same environment. You're not in the same party atmosphere. And the wine doesn't taste as good. So last night's, last night's um, seminar really drove home. There's external forces. And he really drove home the point that um, it's, not, it's not like, you know, it's not the melody of the song. He called it the modality. Um, which is definitely a musical term. So, I mean, this, this seminar really spoke to my, to my background in music, to my degree in music, um, and, and, and having harmony and dissonance and all that. And he used some musical, uh, musical ways to describe stuff. And, and through the whole seminar, I started thinking about how many times, not every time, but many times I will describe wine using musical ideas, terminology, concepts, whatever, that I'll use music as a analogy to how a wine tastes or how a wine is made or its structure or its balance. Um, because, you know, any good song has to have some type of um, good structure to it and good balance to it. Um, even if it's the song itself might be good. It might be that the production wasn't very good. You know, it's like having, you could have had the best grapes in the world, but if you screwed up in the production of the wine, you can make bad wine. You can make bad wine out of great grapes. Just like you can make bad music out of, you know, an excellent, you know, a well-crafted song, like a well-written song and great musicians, but if you record it poorly, or if you don't mix it the right way, that song's not gonna be as good as if you had all those ingredients in place and you recorded correctly. You know, you had the, you, you did the initial recording correctly. Um, 
so uh, it definitely, you know, the, the, the flavors of the wine definitely changed. Um, and they changed for the better in, in the cases that he was trying to say, hey, this wine will go better with this song. And it's not even just like a style of music. It, it's, it's how the music is crafted. Um, he used an example um, with um, Iron Maiden's Run to the Hills. And he hates that song. He says, actually, the worst song ever written or something like that. And I'm at the table. I'm going, it's an awesome song. Like one of the people goes, what is it? I'm going, I kind of sung a little bit of it. Um, and uh, and he, he was already playing at that point. And he was like, you know, this type of music goes really well with, you know, uh, you know the Tanat and Cabernet Sauvignons. And he wasn't just like metal. I mean, he was like dark brooding music goes well because he also played Beethoven's Fifth which it went well with that too. And I just, I just think about how when you're at home enjoying wine, you know, if you're watching a movie or if you're listening to music, it puts you in the right mood for the certain, for, for the right wine. You know, if, you, if, you're, if you're listening to Beethoven's Fifth and you're drinking Pinot Grigio, that Pinot Grigio may not taste as good as you remember tasting it like with no music or with a certain style of music. Um, so it, it does drive home that point. Um, and there was something else I was going to talk about, about tasting wine, sitting at home, tasting wine. I don't remember. <laughs> but the point is that, um, that the seminar definitely um, uh, altered your perception of wine um, in, in a positive way. Oh, I remember his, so his really underlying theme on all this, since he's talking to winemakers and winery owners is choosing the right playlist for your tasting room. So it's not that you're going to be necessarily playing Iron Maiden in your tasting room. If you're, if, if you're, if all you make is cab or heavy, dark brooding wines like cab and Tanat and Moved and you know, these ser serious wines, I guess you want to call them. Um, or you're only going to, you know, you know, you're not necessarily going to play that, but he's trying to say, hey, these styles of music, as in the modality of them, not the genre of music, but the modality of the music makes sense. And right now I'm kind of thinking about when I went to, uh, when I went to uh, Napa on the way back, we stopped uh, at Caduceus, uh, in, in Jerome, Arizona. And, uh, so Maynard, Maynard wasn't there, but Maynard played a lot of rock music, but it wasn't all rock music, but I don't remember all the pieces of music. I mean, I was there for a good two, three hours, uh, in their, in their, it was like a cafe. It wasn't like a, really a tasting room per se. It was a cafe, um, that sold his wine. But thinking back to that, I'm going to say that the majority of that music wasn't just music that Maynard likes or, or, or is trying to um, evoke anything because I seem to remember there being classical music played also um, and some tool music and I'm probably I'm sure some perfect circle and all this you know this, the bands that he's part of I'm sure he played those but I think there was other music in there and thinking back and I'm probably gonna have to I think the gentleman's name is Brian who's the GM of that cafe I'm probably have to try to contact him and say have you heard of this? Did you, or you know this gentleman who, who teaches at, he teaches at, uh, is, that, is it UC Davis? I think he, he teaches like advanced winemaking. It's not UC, so, uh, somewhere in California, I can't remember. But uh, if, if they created a playlist for that. Anyway, so what's on the agenda for today? Well, uh, <laughs> it's on my phone. <laughs> anyway, um, there's several seminars uh, at 8 o'clock, which is soon, about 40 minutes, so I'm going to head downstairs and grab a quick breakfast. Uh, they've got their first set of meetings. I don't know if I can go to the very the 8 o'clock meeting because it says something like the Texas Wine Growers Board of Directors, but everything's like in the main ballroom this morning, like the first like three things. And then there's like somebody from, I guess, the Texas, the Texas Department of Agriculture, I guess they're going to talk, so I, I want to listen to that. And then there's a keynote. And then there's uh, a ten. There's a ten thirty seminar. There's a lunch, and then there's two more seminars after that. And I think today, and actually, I can. It's all on my iPad because I put in my notes. I already lost my goodie bag, by the way. Oh, and if you watch that 
National Football, the National, the National Championship game last night. What? I am so surprised that Auburn, like, I'm not surprised that Auburn won. I'm surprised at how, how Auburn won. That was, like, crazy. But anyway, um, but yeah, I, I lost my goodie bag. I left it at the sports bar here at the, here at the hotel. And uh, I didn't figure that out till I was upstairs eating cinnamon rolls from Whataburger, which I shouldn't be doing. I don't know if you've noticed over the past few months, but I have lost a lot of weight. I don't know if I've even mentioned this, but I, I lost up to 80 pounds, 80, 80, 80 pounds. And uh, the last couple weeks I've gained some of that back. Like I can, I can see it in my face now. Um, so I've, yesterday I went a little too hard with, with food I shouldn't have been eating. So um, I've got to get back to not doing that. Anyway, um, so yes, here we go. So at 10.30, I'm planning on going to a Barrel Fundamentals, and there's two other seminars I'm not interested in. So it's a winery-focused one. Uh, then we have a lunch, and then uh, there's the Exhibitor Grape Exchange, and then at 1 to 2, uh, another winery-focused um, another winery focused seminar is going to be how to deal with high pH grapes and wine. Um, and then there's another little break. And then uh, like basically like a tasting, like a tasting break. We had sex on it from what I can tell because they're sponsored by certain wineries. And then at 2.30, we've got uh, adjusting pH at the winery. Um, another winery focused thing. So um, these are going to be seminars that are very likely over my head in general. Um, I'm reading Understanding Vineyard Soils, and the first chapter or two were, was like easy, like just general stuff about soils. And now it's like, now we're, now we're dealing with chemical formulas, and I'm like, but I'm still reading it. It's kind of like the, I read this uh, uh, book, chemistry, or, you know, or winery, wine chemistry book. It's literally a textbook. Um, and it, I read the whole thing um, last April. And it went way over my head. But I did glean at least a couple nuggets of knowledge out of that. So that's why I'm reading this other book. Um, and then there's another break. And then there's a meeting that I don't have to go to because it's the annual owners and membership meeting. And then there's a reception tonight. <clears throat> um, and then I don't know. I guess it's going to be light food at the reception. So I need to be careful. And then uh, tomorrow we'll have some other stuff. Tomorrow there actually is a couple sections, uh, a couple sessions that um, I'm not sure which ones I'm going to go to, but most mostly I'm either going to ones called a vineyard session or a winery session. If it's a business or a marketing one, I'm probably not going to go to it because that's not why I'm necessarily here. Um, but if I do end up working for a winery, the marketing side probably would make sense because that's what I'd be at. I wouldn't, I'm, Let's make no mistake of it. I'm not trying to become a winemaker. Um, <clears throat> that, that's a romantic fantasy. That is a fantasy. Um, because the reality is, it's a lot of work. And I'm not, a, I'm not opposed to doing work. I mean, I, I, I'm not opposed to doing physical work. I mean, I've been in restaurants for 20-something years. Um, so I understand what work is. At least that type of work. But um, the kind of work that a winemaker does, I'm not interested in doing all that. And I'm not interested in trying to even like do home, home brew wine, wine, <clears throat> you know, buying, buying, you know, stuff and make, putting carboys and going through all that stuff just to make my own wine. Because you know what? There are other people out there that do a way better job than I am and I'd rather pay them to continue to do that and enjoy their wines. <clears throat> anyway, um, let's see what else. That's it for this segment. So, uh, I'm excited to do uh, go the rest of the day. I'm hoping that I'm going to get some interviews um, with some people. And uh, I mean, there's a couple wineries that, that I've been uh, steered towards to, to in, for me to interview. Um, but we haven't nailed down if I'm actually doing that and the times that I've said that I'm available to do it. I've already scouted out, um, like I said yesterday, I already scouted out uh, the perfect spot as long as nobody's sitting there at the time that I need it. And um, we should, that should be it. All right, see you in a little bit. All right, so um, yeah, my voice is all messed up. <laughs> so the um, recap of day one, uh, true day one, for the Texas Hill Country Wine Symposium, winery, Texas Hill Country Winery Symposium. Um, so yesterday was an awesome day. <clears throat> um, 
start out with. They have like a little introduction thing and a keynote. Um, I have to give comps uh, or, or props, not comps, props to uh, the gentleman that did the keynote uh, from Balzac. It was, I, I keep confusing with somebody else I know there, um, but I, this is the first time I met either one of them in person. Um, so this was um, Michael uh, Wayne Bickler, yeah, uh, from Balzac Communications. He gave a great keynote. Um, and he started off by saying that, <clears throat> you know, he was probably going to make some people upset by what he was going to say about the Texas wine industry. And, um, but I, I basically agree with what he's saying is that um, I'm not saying that nobody has stepped up <clears throat> in the Texas wine industry as far as certain wineries trying to, you know, get their name out and um, uh, innovate um, and, and, and have uh, a larger... Uh, volume, you know, production volume, but um, there hasn't been anybody <clears throat> with, and, and, and it, we can't be a Napa, and we can't be, you know, any other exact wine region, but we haven't had anyone that was either like a Robert Mondavi, or, and the, the other example he used was um, Virginia, and that it was a, um, a whole state thing. Now, there's a couple things about that. Texas is a big state. Virginia, it's not a small state. It's not like Rhode Island or Connecticut, but it's not Texas. Now, California's a big state, but that example was Napa, small area, about as big as Bear County. So, um, so the message, the examples may not be the best specific examples, but the message is there that there needs to be a concerted effort, either a concerted effort or a single person or winery or group of small group of wineries that 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 do it and and there are some i mean there's a there's a texas fine wine group and they're trying to advance that and but his his, his biggest point was trying to get texas wines out to the world again it's not like there aren't people doing this but it hasn't gotten traction yet <clears throat> um and then after that there was um uh after that i did Oh, it was the, the calendar. So it was it's basically the, the, the winery calendar. Yeah, it's, it's, like, it's like the, it was supposed to be today, but they had to swap it with something else. Uh, the calendar year of a winemaker. And, um, you know, it was supposed to be for today. And it was at the same time slot as pest management. And I said, well, I'd rather go to pest management than go to a calendar thing. Well, yesterday's other options were not options I really wanted to do. Um, one was, but you know, a budgeting thing for wineries and I, I don't run a winery and I don't have any plans of being in, in a situation at a winery where I got to worry about budgets. Um, and then there was a marketing thing. So metrics and measurement, and that, that might be interesting if I work for a winery at some point. Um, but so I stuck with the calendar year and I'm glad I did. Now, granted, I kind of already knew the general, calendar year for a winemaker. Um, but it was nice to have something like on paper effectively um, that that you could kind of go, okay, in these months, these are the best times to do these things. It's not like every single winery does it exactly like this, but it was one winemaker's opinion <clears throat> of what works for him. And then, the, then we had a lunch. Um, and then the next two, my next two um, uh, seminars were about pH, which roughly equates to acidity and non-acidity in wine, but you can have high acid, but not high pH because pH is very specific to hydrogen ions. And it got into really technical stuff that the first one I barely understood. I mean, I understood because I'd read that chemistry textbook, the wine chemistry textbook last year. Um, so I already had had a basis, but even that book, I was like, Oh, and then the second one was a little bit easier. Um, it was like we 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 uh, tasted three flights of wines um, with different um, acid treatments, whether it was adding tartaric acid or um, doing something called an ion exchange, which is kind of like an osmosis thing or reverse osmosis, where you're taking out um, you're taking out ions to increase the acidity. Um, and, and both of these, among other adjustments, or some people like 
wine critics and psalms and other people like to call them manipulations because you are, you're manipulating the wine. Um, I don't say every single winery in the world does it, but every part of the world in the wine world has some type of adjustment. Now, these adjustments could be as simple as what kind of wood or how much new wood you're using because that's an adjustment on the wine. Um, and then I also got to taste bulk wines from two different uh, wineries. Um, and you know, these are wines that, for whatever reason, they didn't bottle themselves. Um, and it's not that they're crap wines, but they maybe aren't wines that fit their profile or, or worth the standards that they want or, <clears throat> or, they, or they are in the business of selling bulk wine anyway, and this is what they had left over. Um, and most of these wines had a little bit of finishing at some, you know, had some finishing at some point, but some of them had been, hadn't been filtered or fined. So they were like the white wines was easy to see a little cloudy. It was kind of interesting because I've never been able to taste wines like that. Um, and then the, the, the wines from the second seminar, these were wines that had had zero aging. Like they were all 2018s. All they had done was, um, post-fermentation and then they did the acid adjustments. That was it. So no oak, no stuff. So that's kind of cool. I never got to do that type of stuff. Um, and then I got to, um, um, uh, I got to interview two people. And <clears throat> I can never remember Seth's last name, so I got to look it up here. Um, so I got to, where is it? Oh, they don't have their names on here. Um, but Seth from, from um, Wedding Oak, and it's like, it was, it was on the slide. I thought I had it written down somewhere, but I don't. But it's in, it's in the interview, so I'll have it there. Um, and then uh, Sergio Quadra uh, from Fall, uh, Fall Creek, who I've interviewed the owners several years ago. So they were incredible interviews. Um, you know, Seth's more, it was kind of funny because both these gentlemen were on that um acid adjustment panel and they're not quite opposite ends of the spectrum but they they approach wines differently uh, Seth was more the quote scientist and that's how he described himself and he uses ion exchange and Sergio um, I don't think he's necessarily opposed to ion exchange but he doesn't use it and he uses tartaric uses you know uh, the tartaric acid um, adjustment to increase acid when you have a low acid wine and um, uh, it was interesting to get both their, their perspectives on a one-on-one, -on -one. Uh, not just about that. I mean, we talked about it, but that wasn't the interview. We just talked about their winemaking philosophies and what they do and where they're at and who they, you know, where they came from. So really two great interviews. And then um, got some receptions. I actually got to sit down and talk with an old, old uh, winery friend of mine to kind of figure out. They wanted to know <clears throat> what my plans are right now and it, and kind of see if there was something that they could do to fit in with that. And not really because um, I, I'm not looking for what, what they would be able to offer, uh, which is fine. Um, but, you know, I still love their wines. And then there was a reception afterwards and got to talk to a few people and made some more connections and uh, some advice to what I'm going to do uh, as far as uh, employment. Anyway, uh, so for today, I've got more stuff. Um, it starts here in about a half an hour. Um, I've got three more seminars to go to. Um, <clears throat> today, the, the Barrel Essentials is the first seminar. That was the one that got flipped with the um, calendar. Um, kind of sucks because I, well, I still want to go to pest management, but I'm going to go to the barrels because what barrels do to wine and other beverages is fascinating. And, and I think um, as far as how the wine tastes and looks and smells, Barrels, you know, are very essential to that, um, or, or, or not essential, but they are a, a big part of that if, if it's aged in oak. Um, and there's a, there's a seminar later in the day about oak alternatives. So I don't know if that's like, you know, oak chips and oak dust, but, you know, again, these are all things that winemakers do to adjust or manipulate, if you want to call it that, um, their wines. Um, and the goal for most winemakers is to make the wine balanced and better. Um, you may have heard me and other people talk about oak is like makeup. Um, a little bit is good, but a lot is not good, right? Um, and while there are plenty of people out there that love 
overly oaked or overly manipulated wines. Um, there's a lot of people that don't. And you know what? Those, those wines that have a lot of adjustments or a lot of oak or whatever you want to call it, they are delicious. They may not be your style, but they do hit a, a sweet spot, which is also another thing we're going to go to about alcohol and, a, and sweet spots with alcohol. So I'm looking forward to today. Um, I'm really upset that my voice is all messed up. Oh, and the other thing, so you may have heard uh, in, in the interviews, um, this is what I'm doing with the uh, Filmic Pro app and the the iPad I can adjust it. So when you saw me in those interviews looking down and pointing and all that, you know, I can make adjustments and I can stop and start and all that. And um, I, I mean, I got the phone facing me with, with the LCD screen. I'm using I'm using that, that camera um, more as a like a double like make sure that everything's working. But in general, I would normally flip it over and having the iPad would allow me to quickly glance at, okay, is everything looking good? Is the lighting good? Is, um, is it recording? That's the most important part. Um, so yeah, so that's what, I, that's what I use when I do that setup. And then I'm really upset because, okay, on this one, I'm using, I'm using my old school recorder because it's just me. Um, it's, it's just stupidly easy to set up. But my other recorder, um, <clears throat> I don't know what happened my expensive one, but that's this one here. This one, well, you can't really see it, it's all dark. I don't know if I put it there. Yeah, that one there. I'm really upset because um, I've used it, you know, of course I'm a podcast and just me with, with one microphone, but I've used it with two other people and I tried to use it, you know, yesterday with just one other person and I couldn't get, I couldn't get a uh, signal on anything other than one channel, but it was really one microphone. So I might have a bad microphone. I didn't think about taking out the other one, but anyway, it just, I ended up using it with this setup. I haven't been able to listen to it yet. Um, I just haven't taken the time to plug in the headphones to listen to the audio quality, but hopefully it's good. Unfortunately, Seth's interview, I never hit record. I also didn't have the SD card in there. So if I hit hit record, it wouldn't have recorded. And that's how I knew I didn't have the SD card because when for Sergio's, I hit record and said no SD card. So I'm pretty upset about that, but I got so worked up about the, the microphone's not working, and I said, well, whatever, you know, I'm gonna do this. I got out of my routine. So anyway, um, I'm looking forward to today, and um, we'll do another recap tomorrow. All right, so um, <clears throat> it's obviously not the next day at the, the hotel because I'm not in the hotel. I'm actually at home. I'm actually where I normally sit for my reviews, but I got the wall, I got a wall behind me, just like a instead of the kitchen, because um, I'm not doing any reviews. I don't need the green screen. Um, this actually probably should be the setup I use when I don't use green screen. I kind of think I should do that um, because I've got um, <clears throat> I've got my um, I've got my you know what I can probably take a picture of that from here. <laughs> so I've got my um, my uh, what you call it. No, I can take a picture of all the crap in the background. <laughs> but anyway, I've got my um, uh, gimbal um, sitting up there. And um, I'm also trying my new microphone. I didn't have the microphone in time um, for the symposium. So I've got a microphone that's attached to the gimbal. And it's a little small little shotgun mic. It's made by Rode. Um, the, the, it should be pretty good audio. It's not as good as having the lavalier, but this is something where I'm thinking about having for the cocktail conference where I can walk around and I can talk uh, uh, in between seminars or whatever. And if I'm like maybe do an interview, if I'm going to do like a run and gun interview, which I don't plan to do, but I have like a microphone I can have for them instead of like using the, the phone microphone, which is not really great. <clears throat> um, so um, I've got a little jury rig set up here going on with that. Um, so we're going to test that out. I don't even have the lavalier attached. So if the audio is bad, the audio is bad. I, I kind of tested it. It sounds pretty good as long as I'm pretty close in. Um, but um, I, the, the lavalier still is the best. Actually, I tried out. I have uh, these these you know nice in 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 ear head, headphones, um, earphones, and that microphone sounded really good. It said that you know. I wear a necklace and it, the necklace is like right next to that little microphone. I mean, you hear it sometimes with the lavalier, um, but that microphone is like super sensitive. Um, anyway, so let's do the recap. Um, the other reason why I waited so long, <clears throat> this is uh, this is this is Tuesday, 
so it's been a few days. It's, I'm trying to get my voice to get back to something better because it, the, the, that last day, of my you, you can still hear it. it's a little bit, it's still a little bit messed up. But I mean, I could barely talk. So I was like, that that day after, you know, when I was checking out on the Thursday, my voice was still pretty tore up. Uh, even Friday, Saturday, Sunday, somewhat. Yesterday I had tasting group. Uh, my voice was pretty good yesterday. That tasting group, um, and then after tasting group, I didn't. I, I was I was working on some other stuff, working on my service uh, things for tasting group because I I get the host service, so I get to be the master psalm that grills the psalms when they come serve the 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 supposedly expensive wine that's sold you like five bucks. Anyway, uh, so let's recap that uh, that last day. Um, so I went to some really cool seminars, and none of them were super technical. So the first one I went to was the, the one I really wanted to go to was about Oak. And uh, the gentleman who, who, who conducted it, um, he did an outstanding job. He's, uh, he, he, he makes wine at Fall Creek and um, not Fall Creek, Flat Creek. Sorry. I kind of mix up the two. I know which ones they are. And, I, and uh, Flat and Fall Creek are actually kind of close to each other. They're, they're actual wineries, but Fall Creek has their tasting room uh, down in uh, Dripping Springs. And that was the winemaker I interviewed. Um, that I, I interviewed that winemaker actually uh, uh, during the symposium. That he's coming up in two more episodes. So um, anyway, uh, gentleman's a flat. He makes wine at the flat at Flat Creek. I think he also has like his own little wine thing going on too. Um, really great stuff. Um, there was definitely some of the stuff I knew, which is fine. But he he really gave some kind of like kind of clear structure to how oak operates with wine, <clears throat> why we use it and all that. And I even said to him uh, uh, later in the day, we, we hung, hung out uh, later on that day, I was like, and you really should go, you should do this seminar at Texom because it's about an hour long and the Texom seminar is about an hour long. I was like, you really should do that seminar. You know, maybe you can, he didn't, it, it's, it's, it's geeked up as you need to be for, for winemakers. But, you know, I think, um, you know, if you wanted to get a little geekier for Psalms, I don't know. Uh, to talk about talk about like what it does, maybe that winemakers already know that Psalms don't know, because my experience is that <clears throat> um, though I have to say that the Wikipedia entry on oak is way better than it was three or four years ago, and then Wine Folly also has a really good section on her website. Um, these things didn't exist four or five years ago when I did when I did my little uh, wine one hundred and one on oak, so it was it was a lot more difficult to find information. But as far as books. Most of the books that we read, uh, or that were that are suggested reading, don't really cover oak in any depth. They they mention it here and there. You might get a little paragraph or whatever. But anyway, it was a really good seminar on that. <clears throat> and then um, uh, after that, so in that morning, that the morning before, uh, before that first seminar, I'm walking around to all the vendor tables. And just kind of see what was going on. And not everybody was there, but some people were there. And I said, uh, this guy had like his, you know, head corks and screw caps, so closures. And uh, he works for uh, Scott. He works for uh, Scott La Scott Laboratories. And I said, look, so I, I got to go to a seminar here in a little bit. Like, can you give me like the one minute rundown on what you do here? And he, he said, yeah, blah blah blah. By the way, I'm doing I'm doing a seminar <coughs> on um, wine packaging. And he's like, I'm going to talk about all this. I was like, oh, I saw wine packaging and I thought – and the way, it was, the way it was described, it says, you know, overview of the various options available, today's winemaker, topics discussed, we'll be choosing the best package, preparing the wine, common pitfalls, and packaging day considerations. That's true, but he was really talking about cork, you know, all, all the cork things you can do, you know, all, you know cork. Synthetic, screw cap, um, so that that's not really in there. I looked at it as like you know, labeling the bottle and cardboard boxes. I'm like, how interesting is that going to be? Super interesting. Um, you know, he definitely had uh, some some uh, things to say that you know maybe some people uh, in the room may not have liked, or people who could have been in the room. Um, he really, I, I guess, I guess there's the bottle. The people who make bottles uh, claim that their bottles are like perfect every single one is exactly the same and he was like nah not really you know there's there's tolerances and they they're within those tolerances but um 
with screw caps, it's actually very vital that you get the right screw cap and it's it's attached to the bottle properly um, because of the variances that that happen with with bottles. Whereas cork, there's a little more uh, it's a little more forgiving. Of maybe in, you know uh, the tolerances maybe not being perfect uh, in the neck of the bottle. Um, so you talked about that. Talk about back in the box, you know, and the, the advantages, the disadvantages of that. So really interesting. I really enjoyed it. I'm so glad I, I just kind of randomly ran into him. So I had no idea he was doing a seminar. Um, <clears throat> and then um, then I did a seminar on alcohol sweet spotting. Um, so this is something. This gentleman who did the the music one. His name is Clark Smith, um, and he uh, talks about a um, basically reverse osmosis. Okay, um, so what this does is it, it 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 removes the alcohol and water out of the wine so that you can adjust the alcohol to hit a certain point. And it, and, and it I, I believe it um, even a tenth of a percent of alcohol can make a huge difference. Sometimes not. Sometimes there's little or no difference. But sometimes. You can make a huge difference in the the how a wine is thought of. It's like how good the wine is, how pleasant the wine is to drink. Um, and, you know, sometimes a lower alcohol is better. Sometimes a higher alcohol is better. You know, sometimes there's multiple sweet spots, um, but some are better than others, or, or mo more people like those wines than than, than other people on certain alcohol levels. Um, so you went through the science on that. It wasn't too too terribly like technical. Like I understood. I'm sorry, I probably understood at least 80-90% of exactly what he was talking about. Um, so super interesting. Uh, we went through a bunch of different wines um, that the Texas wineries uh, kind of let um, – they let him uh, – uh, uh, or actually this lady from Texas Tech allowed her to like uh, manipulate. Um, these, these were all 2018 wines. So these were – it was like unfinished you know, they had, some of them hadn't been fined yet or filtered. Um, so we had a couple cloudy white wines. So, I mean, totally cool. So I don't ever get to taste wines like that. So I geeked down on that. That was great. Um, and then the, um, the next one I went to was called The Use of Oak Alternatives <clears throat> uh, and Oxygen During Winemaking. And that one was, that one was really cool. Um, basically, the oak alternative. So it, it's oak. But it's instead of it's it's an oak barrel alternative, so things that we don't really talk about very often. I might mention it here and there in a review, but things that are not really talked about in uh, value wines is getting that oak characteristic, the flavors of oak, not necessarily the aging uh, advantages of oak, but the flavor of oak. And there's things like oak chips, oak um, oak dust. Um, uh, you can also put liquid tannin in there to give some of that tannic feel. Um, so talking about that kind of stuff and then how oxygen is used, so micro-oxygenation uh, and just the oxygen process and how it, how it can be used um, in a beneficial way uh, during – I need to not hit the table or else that's going to shake. Um, oh, no. It shakes a little bit, but – um, it is a gimbal, but it's not perfect. Um, but anyway, so how the um, uh, how oxygen works in, in each different part of uh, the, the winemaking process, what you can do and, and what the benefit is to doing it at that point versus a different point. But it, it, I already kind of knew this, but the earlier you can introduce oxygen into wine, the better. The better it, 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 it um, handles oxidation. Okay, you might hear some noise in the background, a little house cleaning going on. Um, so super interesting. Again, not too terribly technical, but some technical stuff in there. And then the last one <clears throat> was a winemaker panel. It was the Italian grape variety panel. And we had um, uh, a friend of mine, Jennifer, uh, was one of the moderators along with the gentleman named Carl Hudson. He works with a 4.0 winery. It's a tasting room in, uh, Fre oh, that, in Fredericksburg. But hey. Don't be so loud. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> um, anyway, uh, it was the tasting room on 290 Wine Trail. And um, so they moderated it. And we had um, uh, Paul Bonrigo, uh, not dad, but uh, the son. He, and he's super cool, by the way. He uh, interviewed both of them. 
for um, uh, back in Sinahoff. So we tasted one of his wines. Jim Evans from Owasso Winery. Todd Webster from Brennan. Uh, Todd Crow Crowell from Ron Yates Wines, who I got to see Ron uh, during the during the uh, symposium, and I promised I would come see him soon. Uh, and then Dave Riley, long, long time viewers of the show, will recognize that name. He makes he makes wine over at Dukeman, and I haven't seen him since my interview with him. So it was awesome to get to see him. Um, I told him I was going to drink the Alianico. Uh, like the next night, and I found it when I got home. I actually had already drank it. Sorry, but it was good. Um, so they 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 each had you know they each they each have an Italian wine they make or there. Some of them make several Italian wines. So we went through that panel of wines, all excellent wines. I mean, these were some of the rock star winemakers in in Texas. Uh, there are other rock star winemakers. Don't don't get me wrong. These are not the only ones. I mean, I got to see. You know, rock star winemakers from everywhere. Um, and some of these people I've met in the past, some of them I haven't, some of them I only know through social media. And not everybody was there from the Hill Country, but a lot of a lot of the the, the movers and shakers for the Hill Country wine uh, wine uh, wineries were there. Um, and then outside of that, I mean it was just it was just a really good um, uh, uh, thing for me to go network with some people, if nothing else, network with like some future visits for, for the podcast. Um, you know, the job search is still going on. Um, uh, by the time you see this, there won't be anything decided yet. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. It's, it's just going on, got leads, you know, there's some, there's some positive movement, but I don't have anything secured yet. Um, so that's, you know, that's fine, but by, uh, uh, I have this show, and then I have two more interviews, and then after that, I'll have the cocktail conference recap, and then after that, I don't know exactly what will happen with the podcast. Um, I had, so I don't know if I mentioned this in the other, other clips, but I had, um, so my friends there were Creative Palette had inquired about sending samples. Now, it's just a, a general email, not directly just to me. I mean, they send it to all the people that they, they send samples to. And I just let them know, say, hey, this is going on. And depending on where I'm at, I may or may not be able to do wine reviews <coughs> um, uh, because there might be a conflict of interest. Um, I'm hoping that the one place that I'm really trying to get into, um, I can still do the wine reviews, but um, it's very possible that I can't. Or maybe I can, and it could be part of the job. Um, though it might have to be, I may not have to do it on this podcast, maybe something else that I would do. Um, what I would like to do is if I can't do wine reviews any longer is at least try to do interviews. Now, so that, what that means is that, um, interviews have to be someplace where I can go, go there and back usually in one day or only like, or whatever two days off I would have or Skype interviews. Um, you know, I still would, you know, if I, if I can go out of Texas, um, uh, like, you know, inside the country, like take a vacation, you know, maybe my vacation time to do that, like I've done in the past with Napa and France, I would still want to do that. You know, my next goal for out of the country wine trip is Italy, um, though very likely what I want to do with that trip is to visit family in the south of Italy. <clears throat> um, unfortunately, I would have had to skip Rome. I mean, I would fly into Rome probably. Um, let see family in the south of Italy uh, and then go up to either Tuscany or Piedmont, most likely Tuscany. Um, but, uh, you know, it's very possible I don't have to do like it with Burgundy and go right into Tuscany and, and not see the family. So hopefully the Italian side of the family doesn't like come find me and kill me <coughs> or get their Sicilian cousins to do it. Um, anyway, did I say that? <laughs> um, so uh, that's that's the next plan, uh, which was supposed to be this year, but that's got that's been put on hold for sure. Um, anyway, I had an awesome time at the symposium. I'm really looking forward to going to the cocktail conference. Uh, that's this week that I'm recording all this. Um, so it should be three episodes from now. Um, looking forward to doing that. Also making some contacts there. Uh, I've got interviews lined up with that too. So yeah, I do have interviews lined up at least one or two right now for sure uh with um some some you know uh, uh spirits people i guess i should have let's redo that i guess boom let's turn there we go that's 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 the uh, that's the problem with using natural light and all that is that you know the the exposure kind of with, without using auto exposure like i don't know 
probably should just live in an auto. Anyway, <clears throat> that's going to do it for this episode. As always, on the website, I just realized, you know, that, oh, by the way, website. I'm not sure by the time you see this episode if everything will be finalized over there, but I have about 12 episodes. Let's see here. Let's see what, what I, I have my notes here. Where, where are my notes? Here we go. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We've got almost 20 episodes that on the website I don't have an embedded video on. Now, there was way more than that, like over 100, 150, something like that. And until over the weekend, I went in and, and, and copied all the YouTube embed codes for each episode. But doing that, I found out that I'm actually missing videos on YouTube. So, real quick, why did that happen? Um, and if you've seen me post the videos on YouTube, they're not new, they're old, and this is why. Um, so, back when blip.tv got bought out and then got closed down a uh, months, few months later, I, uh, and in conjunction with that, not the same time, but, you know, the same thing, you know, two things happened, not the same time. Google went in and combined everybody's accounts into one account. Well, my YouTube channel didn't migrate properly to whichever Google account it was supposed to be associated with. So I had to create a new one for Elite Wine. Um, and so I uploaded all the videos, or so I thought. And Blip was supposed to send all the videos there. Now, I don't remember if Blip was before the shutdown blip was before the migration for Google, the consolidation of Google or after. Um, but blip was sending all, all videos to YouTube among other places because I would upload the blip and it would you know up, uh, upload once to distribute everywhere. Unfortunately, nothing like that really exists that's reasonable for somebody like me. Enterprise, yeah, that's what happened. That, that, that company became like an enterprise one, so you spend thousands of dollars a year. I'm like, I don't need that. Um, YouTube's totally fine. But... Uh, um, so apparently I missed some videos, uh, and, and they range everywhere from episode 22 all the way to episode 188. One of my Halloween episodes is not on YouTube. So, um, and then 185, uh, episode 185 is like completely gone. Not even, I don't even, I don't even have it on, uh, the website. I don't even have a posting. So at least all these other ones I have, um, I have I have like a posting on the website, like so it says what the title of the of the thing was, and I think 185 I don't even have the title. I don't even have a, a post. So anyway, over the next few weeks between now and when you probably see this video, uh, I plan to upload all those videos to YouTube because I have them. They're all stay they're all saved, and then recreate the post and all that. So you'll you'll see a lot of activity. Um, You've seen a lot of activity going on. You may be still some more activity depending on how things work as far as my timing. So that's what happened. So after, by the time you see this, I should be 100% every video is on me. The only videos you won't have is the Psalm School, Psalm A School ones. I'm not, I'm not going to put them up. They were on Blip on a separate, on a separate account. Um, I never migrated that Psalm A School over to YouTube because, um, Honestly, the, 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 the most important part of those Psalm School videos are really the write-ups. And the write-ups are still there, so there's no video involved with it. And I'm not going to upload them again. I'm not going to recreate them. At least not at this point. All right, so that's going to do it. As always, on the website, click the links, oh, sorry, click the links above to friend me up. Click click the links below. To, or click the link below. Uh, is there anything? Yeah, I'll, 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 the main website for the symposium. I'll click that, and yeah, maybe some other stuff. Maybe I'll give some love to the wineries and all that. That I, you know, the people that were there, uh, the people that did seminars. Maybe I'll get get their information, and then get the donate buttons on this side. On the interviews, I was going over here. This over there. Yeah, I don't know. Is it over there? I don't know. The phone should be over there. Anyway, we'll see everyone again next time.